and we're live. Woohoo! Hi. And this week we have a le storm permitting, because we've had a power cut already this evening. We have the amazing uh, Laura Cockett. Is it Cockett or is it not Cockett? Cockett yeah, yeah. Oh, we Cockett. could go with Cockett, but no, Cockett's what Cockett I mean. is like the uh, highest <laughs> yeah. uh, option. And you are an aspiring uh, romance writer. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I've written my first romantic comedy. It will be yeah. out in early April. Currently working on the kind of final details of that. So the the proofreading and the uh, blurb and cover and all of that stuff. Um, I'm working out how to put it out into the world and also trying to work on book two and keep the day job going as well. Yeah. <laughs> so it's busy. Yeah. So you've given me 10 books today. I so. have. Shall we go straight on to number one? Let's so go. Like top of the pops from the 1950s. <laughs> Let's go straight in at number one. So, Vanity Fair by William Thackeray. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, it's funny you say straight in at number one. This is, you know, it's on the list and it is one of my all time favorite yeah. books. Um, and it's, I imagine for a lot of people, it's a pretty famous book. Um, it's also been made into TV series and into films, but just for anyone who doesn't know, um, the premise of the book, it follows um, our, I won't say heroine, um, it follows the the uh, life of Becky Sharp, who is um, uh, an orphan who uh, and is you know very poor and the story starts where she is in um, a very well-to-do school for girls and she's able to you know participate in the lessons, but her very low, very poor social status, she's never allowed to forget. And she becomes very good friends with the lovely Amelia. Um, and the book then follows them as they um, grow up and leave the school and then go off into the world, into Regency society. And the book is set um, around the time of the Napoleonic Wars as well. And that comes into the book because it's quite an epic tale. If, if anyone's ever seen a hard copy of the book, it's a it's quite a tome. Um, and it's and it probably I mean, I couldn't say exactly, but I think it must span a period of about 15 or so years um, of these kind of two main characters. But the protagonist, the main protagonist um, is Becky Sharp. Yeah. And one of the things that I mean, this book, I think Thackeray called it um, a book without a hero, which I might argue with, but um, you know, I think there is a hero <laughs> hidden in there, but it's definitely yeah. not Becky Sharp. And I think what is so fantastic about Becky Sharp, and one of the things that makes this book so enjoyable, is she has very few redeeming qualities. She's not a particularly likable person. And of course, normally <laughs> as writers and as readers, we want our hero, even if they're flawed, to have likable redeeming qualities. And what's amazing here is that this is, you know, a masterclass in writing a, a fairly unlikable character that you end up rooting for anyway. And she's so compelling. And I think in some ways, the bit that is compelling is that she is an underdog um, within that society and she uses all of her wiles, her beauty, her she's very smart, very clever and, and her talents to climb the social ladder and get herself to, you know, push herself up the social ladder. Um, and, you know, she's effectively using people and manipulating people throughout the book. And yet, you know, you, I mean, I, I think I you admire her, you end up admiring her and you yeah. end up thinking, well, if I, you know, if I was her at that time, and I could, I would, you know, there's, so I think that's one of the things that I, I really love about the book. And also what's brilliant about the book as well is that Amelia, her, her best friend is a great foil for her. And, and, and because they're both very flawed. Um, Amelia is saccharine sweet. Um, and although at first that all seems lovely and yeah. um, actually, as the book goes on, you realize how flawed she is and how flawed her view of the world is as well and, and the damage that that can cause to relationships i don't want to say too much and, and give too much away for anyone who hasn't read it um but in the end um there is this kind of other so you know thackeray i think has called this the, a book without a hero but there is a, a character within it william dobbin who i think in some ways He's is the hero. hero of the book because yeah. he is the most faithful true honest character of the book um and that 
that steadiness runs, you know, throughout him, throughout the book, while these, this sort of wildness of the people in his life and the Napoleonic Wars and the tumult of that goes on around him. So, so I think this book is kind of um, on my top five always. I've got multiple different versions. <laughs> yeah. Um, haven't read them all, but, um, but I've, you know, I kind of collect them because of this utterly compelling protagonist um, mm. and what she does and what she's prepared to do. And, and that is what I think makes this such a great book. And, it, and it's also, you know, Thackeray is poking fun at that society, at, at Regency society as well, kind of through the character of Becky Sharp. Um, but ultimately it's her, for me anyway, that really carries that story. You know, it's, it's her you root for. Um, and I think, yeah, and I think that's why it will always, for me, stay in that top five. Okay. First one. Shall we go on to the next one? And I'll actually remember to play the transition graphic. This oh. One. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's really dramatic. Only <laughs> Hold by Mary Stewart. Yeah, so this so, is really interesting. So um, I was thinking about this, where, about yeah. why I chose to put this on the list, because actually I, I read this book years ago. Um and I should say, I'm, I'm not really a Mary Stewart fan. I actually came across this book because my, my parents had it in the bookcase. And oh. at some point in time when I was, I don't know, I don't, in my late teens or something, sometime when I was at home, I must have run out of my own stuff to read or not fancied any of it. So I had always seen this book and I really liked the cover and the title. And I just thought, let's see what that book is about. And the thing... And the premise of this book is it's a it's one of Mary Stewart's later books. And although I'm not a big Mary Stewart fan, I haven't read a lot of her work. I do understand that this is somewhat different from a lot of the yeah. other kind of romantic suspense that she wrote. So this is um, I think it's classed as a gothic romance. It's set in the 1940s. And the protagonist in this book is a woman called Galis, um, who is known as Jilly. And she inherits her aunt's house but she also inherits her aunt's um, reputation as a local witch. And I think the thing about this book that has stayed with me is I think it created, creates one of the most sort of evocative senses of place that I've ever experienced with a book. Yeah. Because what I remember about this book isn't the story in detail, but the feeling that yeah. it left me with which I can still feel now as we're talking about it. I can feel the feeling of reading that book and I can feel what Thorny Hold is like and I can see some of the pictures of the places that Stuart paints with the words. And I think that's what makes this book stand out for me. So it's a book I still have now. I don't know if my mum knows that she didn't get that bag. Um, so it's on my shelf now. Um, and yeah, and I think that I think it was so evocative in terms of the sense of place and the sense of magic. It has an aspect of sort of magical yeah. realism about it. Um, and there's a, a real otherworldly, it's a love story, but there's an otherworldliness to it as well. Um, and I think that there's a part of me as well. Sorry, this is my dog <laughs> coming into the shot there. What's um, the name of your dog? Uh, this is Milo. You Milo, going, hello Milo. You to make an appearance, a brief appearance. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Thank you. Sit down. Um, yeah, and I think, in, and I think there's something about Thornyhold. There's a part of me, I suppose, that has so sort of taken on the feeling of what that place yeah. feels like, and that sense of magic that you can sometimes find with a house and in the countryside, and with because the witchcraft in this book isn't. This isn't Harry Potter and magic wands. This is. Um, it's more what would be called she's like a hedge witch so she's a witch who works with the land and with potions and with the earth and so there is something about this that is deeply connected to the earth and to the countryside and place as well so i think in in that way it's a powerfully evocative book yeah. so that's how that came to be on the list we actually did have a witch on the show oh, did you time. so um well modern kind of english which, if you know what I mean, so I, I do, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm not sure how that I think, but yeah, we've got history on this show, which is <laughs> uh, knows. right. 
You deserve each other by Sarah Hoggle. Hoggle. Sarah Hoggle, I think it is. Hoggle. Yeah. yeah. So this is a this is a much more um, modern book than the other two, yeah. and it's one that I read more recently. Um, and it's one of the it's a rom com, and one of the only books I think that has ever really made me laugh out loud. Um, lots of books are funny, but you know it, it's a sort of it's a chuckle or it's a little yeah. internal laugh and an appreciation. But this really made me laugh out loud a few times. And there is some really sharp writing and some fantastic descriptions of how I think the thing <laughs> of how people do things and how people react to things that tells you so much about that it's such skillful writing because it tells you so much about the characters. So it's a brilliant case in so many ways of sh of that whole thing we think about as writers about show not tell. You know, you you learn about these people by seeing their behaviors and stuff. So it's brilliant. And the premise of this as well, the other thing that I think is great about this is it's sort of a romance story turned on its head because the main character, Naomi, um, or the two main characters really, we kind of see it through Naomi's point of view, um, but she and her fiance, Nicholas, are together. They're a couple. Yeah. So you sort of wonder how a romance <laughs> novel starts out like that. But what's happened is their relationship has, um, and this is the premise, I'm not giving anything away here, the relationship has kind of stagnated. Um, they're not even fighting. Um, they've got a wedding coming up in just a few months time and Naomi feels trapped and stuck mm. and she wants out of the wedding. But the problem is, is that um, this is a very lavish wedding that Nicholas's mm. parents are have pushed for and she doesn't want to get stuck with the bill if she pulls out at this yeah. late stage. So she, so the, so what then happens, and this is what the story is, is she goes all out to be an absolutely dreadful fiance in the hopes that she can make him call off the wedding, yeah. so she can get out of the relationship and not be stuck with a bill. And that is such a smart premise because it really sets you up for some really feisty scenes I think here but I think what's brilliant as well is that it's funny and it's feisty and these but it's got a it's got such um a you know it's very grounded as well this isn't a frothy book you know there's yeah. there's a really what I think so great is there are these feisty relationships it's said in a relatively small town these people have ordinary jobs you know this is a, these are people that you would you know, we would know, we would be neighbours with these people, sort of people. Um, and it almost gets a little bit dark in a few places, but it never stops being playful. Um, but what it has at the heart of it, I think, that made it such a great book for me as well, is is the relationship is, you know, as, again, don't want to say too much, but it is a rom-com, so we kind of yeah. know where it's going to go. But as that relationship develops or redevelops, um, there's real depth there, real, real emotional depth. And I think sometimes with romances or with rom-coms they can feel a little bit surface a little bit frothy yeah. and sometimes that's great and that's what we want as readers um but for me sometimes it's great to find a book like this that is really funny but has such heart as well really laugh out loud you really care about the characters so yeah so you deserve each other highly recommend <laughs> that's good all right the Earth Abides by George R. Stewart. Lots of traditional yeah. author names here. So. Yeah, so this this book um, may be less familiar to a lot of people. It's a much older book. Yeah. Um, it was written in 1949, and it won the um, inaugural Science Fiction Prize in 1951. Mm -hmm. And this is a book um, that I read because my dad told me it was one of his favorite books and just sort of periodically went on about it until I read it. Um, and I'm very glad that he did. Um, and the premise of this book is, um, I never quite know where the line is. So it's listed as post-apocalyptic, but I think that some people feel like there's a point when it thing post-apocalyptic tips over into dystopian so to be yeah. clear this book spans a period of about 60 years so we follow the protagonist for about for about 60 years and what happens is um and I think one of the reasons that this book stands out for me as well is that there is no it's not about um a nuclear disaster it's not about um um some kind of you know horrific event that sort of 
it's not about zombies it's not about any of those sorts of things yeah. which so much of that sort of fiction has in some way um the premise of this book is that you know the student wakes up um and um he has gone on a camping trip into the mountains and while there he um he gets ill so he sort of sleeps for several days to you know to get through the fever in this in this cabin and when he wakes up and comes down from the mountain and goes out into the world the entire world has as he knew it has changed you know he's there's you know he goes past a gas station um because this is set in america um yeah. and um and there's nobody there there are no cars on the roads there are no people in the shops and the first part of the book is is because he hasn't he doesn't know what's happened is mm. him trying to understand what on earth has gone on and there's nobody around to tell him um but what makes this i think such a beautiful and outstanding book is that it isn't really only a small part of the book is about the immediate survival yeah and, and the reason the book i think is called earth abides is the 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 earth is almost one of the main characters in the book because as we go on we uh, you know as the years pass a lot of the sort of just descriptions are about um how the world and the earth slowly reclaims everything that has been left behind in this place with almost no people left yeah um, slowly you know the 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 weeds and the grasses pull apart the roads and the trees and the shrubs pull down the buildings and you know it's simple things like quite early on you know early there's no electricity but but also the water stops running because power mm. is required for the water so everything that we that is familiar just slowly disappears but what's so beautiful is is when you get through the book i'm trying to describe this without giving too much away <laughs> yeah. is um is I suppose what so much of this fiction doesn't do, because it doesn't usually go so far ahead past the um, apocalyptic event, yeah. is you kind of see the next generations who are being born into a world which doesn't have, you know, electricity or running water, etc., and where survival, in order to survive, you have to live very differently. Your day looks very different. Um, you know, the things that you have to do. And so I think I could say this without giving anything of the story away. So there's a there's a point when the children, some of the children in the story are resisting learning to read and only one or two of the adults are, you know, trying to insist that they should learn to read. But basically as, as this tiny community that has come together yeah. slowly through the book, there isn't general support that the children should be taught to read and what you come to realize is that's how earth abides and how everything will be lost because as soon yeah. as you have a, an entire generation that can't read all the books and things which still exist all that knowledge is gone and it's just it's just one of the most beautiful books i've ever read and i think that it would be amazing if it was discovered by more readers now because I think when it came out you know it's not a book I've ever heard anybody other mm. than my dad talk about yeah and I would you know strongly recommend it it's it's not if, if you want zombies and big high drama it's not that book it's a it's a hauntingly beautiful exploration of what life might look like beyond an event yeah I was gonna say I'm just gonna check your dad isn't George R. Stewart <laughs> no he's not. I think he probably wishes he was no he's not <laughs> Right, let's go on to the next one. Yeah. Like Water for Chocolate by Laura Esquivel. Esquivel, yeah. Yeah, so this book is on the list for a kind of an interesting reason. This book is sort of on the list as a great example of why I think everybody should go shopping for books in charity shops, oh. um, which is one of my favourite things to do. Yeah. And I think that what happens... These days, in particular, is with a particularly with a lot of with a lot of online buying. You know, the algorithms increasingly show us the books that the search engines and Amazon, etc., think we want to read, which is really helpful and that's great. Um, and when we go into bookshops, we often head for the sections that we think hold the books that we want to read. 
But I love going to charity uh, to charity shops and looking for books because that's how I find things. It wouldn't occur to me to read, um, and it's such a such a low risk way to yeah. pick a bundle of books for a pound or so each. And if you don't get around to reading them, that's fine. But maybe you discover something that you missed the first time round. And that's what happened for me with like Water for Chocolate because um, I found this in a charity shop. Um, when the book was first published, I would have been, you know, probably at the time a bit too young for it to really yeah. register with me. So I came to it a lot later. Um, and it is still, for me, one of the books, a bit like something like Thornyhold, very different in style, but it, it's it's a very evocative book. Um, it's very lyrical with magical realism, and it's unlike anything else I think I've ever read, really. And the format of it, or the premise, I should say, is that um, it follows the fortunes of this Mexican family and the youngest daughter in the family, um, Tita, um, is forbidden to marry because they have a tradition in the family that the youngest daughter must remain single in order to look after the aging parents. So um, Tita falls in love with um, Pedro, who is the son of the sort of family or the farm next door, um, and he falls in love with her as well. Um, but when he asks if he can marry her, her mother refuses the marriage. So they are both heartbroken. Mm -hmm. um, and then Pedro actually marries Tita's sister her older sister just to be able to stay close to Tita yeah and the book is actually written I think it's 12 chapters and each chapter explores um, a particular recipe so an event in the series in the family's life but also but through a recipe because this is a book that is as much about cooking and food as mm. it is about anything else it's about and what's amazing is and this is where it's almost like a fairy tale for adults. This magical, it has this magical realism element. So Tita, who is, you know, constantly heartbroken, forced to see the man she loves often, but is in deep pain mm -hmm. because he's with her sister. So she cooks her feelings, not on purpose, but she cooks her feelings into the food. You know, her feelings are woven into this amazing food she makes. And the food then has powerful impact on the people who eat it again it's not intentional it's, it's kind of it's just what's happening and um the consequences of the food are dramatic and range anywhere from sort of sickness to uncontrollable lust on the people who mm. eat it and and you know and fire and i think that in some ways the it's almost as if it's a uh an outward representation of the consequences of love denied because this is tita's pain you know but instead of just suffering inwardly it accidentally finds its way into the food and affects the people around her many of whom are complicit or part of the fact that she can't be with Pedro so a, an absolutely beautiful book I think um it will make you very hungry as well because there's so much in there that yeah. is about food um and I think yeah I, I highly highly recommend I highly recommend the book and I highly recommend charity shop book shopping yeah well i probably shouldn't say that you should obviously buy it on amazon he says <laughs> buy on amazon absolutely <laughs> buy on amazon and um <laughs> yeah um well, we have got one book at the end which i don't think it actually is available firsthand on amazon so we'll come to that later yeah. one thing i noticed about this book and i could be wrong so, but it looks like the audio book is only available in spanish <laughs> so oh, is it? Um, Yes, this is interesting. I've never seen that before. So. Oh, right. Okay. But you can get all the other versions are in yeah. English. So um, yeah. there's obviously a Spanish version of all the other versions, but there isn't an English audio book for some reason. Yeah. Anyway, let's go on to the next book. Book Lovers by Emily Henry. Yes. So um, Emily Henry is one of the romantic comedy authors that I, I'm enjoying the most at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um. And I think maybe this is partly for reasons that I touched on with um, You Deserve Each Other. You know, Henry doesn't write sort of frothy romances. They are good fun. They're very sassy and feisty um, and very self-aware. You know, I think that's one of the things I really enjoyed about Book Lovers and why I picked this one. Because um, even the the opening, you know, the, the, the setting up of this story sort of turns things upside down a bit. So 
for anyone who's ever watched, in fact, you don't even you don't even need to have read a romantic comedy. Uh, you could have just seen a film. So we're all yeah. familiar with sort of that hallmark film premise of the big city guy with the powerful <laughs> city job has a reason to go to the small town to buy up the bakery or close down the dog home or whatever it is, and then gets there and realizes that he doesn't want big city life. He wants this very lovely, charming woman that he's met in the tiny town. Um, and so he leaves his big job and his, you know, uh, uh, kind of higher maintenance city girlfriend as well. And what's great in this is, is that Henry very consciously, very deliberately turns that around because Nora, who is our um, key protagonist of this, is the, you know, the um, high achieving, um, higher maintenance city girl who gets left for the, you know, uh, country, yeah. country and, and this isn't a character that, you know, what's great is we don't, follow that character that much in these sorts of books so that's what's really enjoyable but what happens in this is you know she is the you know as as the blurb says she is the um uh, the um the heroine for her clients because she's a um a book editor and she is a cutthroat literary agent but she's persuaded to go and do the, this trope she's persuaded to go to sunshine falls in north carolina um with her sister um and she is followed there by not on purpose by um her sort of arch nemesis so it's kind of a bit of an enemies to lovers book as well yeah. but it's it's very funny it's very sharply written and observed um and i think um it has a self awareness of the genre as well but she doesn't keep pointing out but it kind of sets that up which is really quite refreshing as well so it's really well grounded very funny not frothy um, and for anyone who likes a good romance or romantic comedy, Emily Henry, Book Lovers, is a great one. Okay. And uh, going to a book I've actually read. <laughs> so, oh, ooh, if I press the right button. Persuasion by Jane Austen. Um, well, I say read, I've listened to the audio book. I listen, I've got this enormous free all the Jane Austen audio books. Oh, um, brilliant. So have you listened uh, to them all? Yes, I have. Well, my mum was a massive Jane Austen fan, so we always ended up watching like all of these various Jane Austen things. So actually, it is, she's an author I actually know a lot about, bizarrely. Yeah, <laughs> like, well, you know, know, we have something in yeah. common there, because my mum's a huge Austen fan as well, yeah. which, which is definitely where I got some of that from. But, but I must just tell you a story then, because... Um, because uh, a lot of people will be familiar with the BBC adaptation of okay. Pride and Prejudice, which was very famous. Um, and there's a scene in that where Mr. Darcy, Colin Firth, comes out of the lake having been for a yeah. swim. And uh, my mum and I used to sometimes go to stately homes around the UK. And, and if they had uh, been used in a Jane Austen adaptation, we check that out and we go, oh, that's where they filmed. <laughs> that yeah. And we ended up at Lime Park in Cheshire one one very cold spring day some years ago, which is which was the exterior for um, Mr. Darcy's Pemberley. estate. Pemberley, yeah. Pemberley for Pemberley, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we saw this couple. We were walking round the lake, and we saw this couple um, down sort of on the other corner of the lake. This was a very cold March day, um, and the guy was starting to strip off, and we saw him. What on earth is going on? And under his clothes, his, his normal clothes, he had on like a white long period shirt and black breeches. And he got in the lake and started splashing himself with water while his girlfriend was filming it to give, you know, to be her Mr. Darcy. So oh. that's a commitment. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, so yeah, I'm very fond of all of the Jane Austen books. And I read, I've read them all. Um, and I read them all quite young, actually. Um, and I was in, yeah, I was in my kind of early mid-teens when I read them all except for persuasion. And I think that's because, um, you know, when you're younger and you're reading Jane Austen, yeah. then there's a huge amount of, well, first of all, you're closer in age to the characters in books like Sense of Sensibility and Emma yeah. and, and Prejudice. And to me, you know, in my teens, you know, a 27 year old heroine seemed positively ancient. Um, <laughs> I'd love to be 27 again now, yeah. but anyway, it seemed ancient. Um, so and it, and it seemed it has a different quality, I think, than yeah. a lot of her other books. It's her last novel, I think, and it feels different. Um, and it's a completely different story, really, than her other books, which all really follow 
young girl's first love. Yeah. And so, but you know, like you've listened to all the audiobooks, I felt as I as the years went by, I thought I have to read Persuasion, otherwise I haven't read the set. So mm. I, I must get to it at some point. And I think coming to it a little bit later on was absolutely right because I could properly appreciate it then. And actually for me, I think it's probably my favorite of yeah. Austen's novels. Um, and so for those who aren't familiar with it, the story follows um, Anne Elliot, um, who is a 27 year old woman, um, which is a spinster um, for her time, for the time of the yeah. book. Um, so she is, you know, beyond ideal marrying, marrying age. And she was um, in, you know, in her younger years, she was engaged to Captain Wentworth, mm. um, who was a sailor, and she was persuaded out of the marriage by her father and her very good friend, um, because his, he wasn't seen as being eligible enough, because she was from quite an eligible family, um, and was expected to make a materially better match. So she was persuaded out of it. He went off to sea, and the book actually picks up when he returns years later, when yeah. she's 27, excuse me, and um, and neither of them have met anybody in the interim. She's still single, so is he. And I think that what's beautiful is it's an exploration of a second chance at love. And mm. what I think is so beautiful throughout it is it never stops feeling so fragile. I think there are other other books which explore second chances but what's so beautiful about this and it part of it will be to do with the period of the book you know we, this is a the English aren't great at always saying what they feel now I mean they were terrible <laughs> time Austin was right and you <laughs> could just yeah. be up front there's an awful lot of you know what what isn't said what you can't say and so you can yeah. feel throughout the book how much there's there's a degree of misunderstanding and resentment that exists between them but there's also, um, you can feel how much they, they do want to talk and, and say things and they are prevented, you know, through the circumstances under which they meet. That never really happens. Yeah. They don't get to have that conversation. And you do feel, I mean, you, I suppose you, if you stopped and thought about it, you'd think, well, they must get together because this is a romance. But actually, it, what's brilliant is throughout the book, it feels like they might not. Yeah. And it feels, and it has a depth to their relationship and a maturity that Austin's other novels don't have. I think, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we, we want Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy to get together. And, and, and we, I suppose, again, if we stepped out, we would expect that they would. But at the same time, I think they'd both be okay if they hadn't. But yeah. for Wentworth and for Anne Elliot, you feel like this is a great love. This is a great love. And actually they will, neither of them will be with anybody else they will you know if they can't be together and so i think that's what's so powerful for me about this book you know it's such a beautiful exploration of that second chance um and i think in many ways the depth of that relationship is what makes it austin's best book and her i think her most underrated yeah. um because although it has it still has what we love austin for it still has those slightly ridiculous um side characters you know family members and friends and things you know the the sort of mrs mrs bennett equivalents um those still appear um but they're not as prominent and the book doesn't feel as light it has a different quality to it um and i think that uh, i think it deserves to be i think the affection we feel for things like pride and prejudice sense of sensibility some of that persuasion deserves more of that yeah yeah, well, you're the first person who's mentioned it. I think we've had quite a few other Jane Austen books on this. Yeah, and that's because I think, and, and I thought, oh, I've got to have a Jane Austen, and, and you know, Pride and Prejudice is always the sort of thing that comes straight to mind. Then I thought, oh, no, it's got to be Persuasion. No, I, I think actually Persuasion, um, for the very reasons you, you say, in that it's it's a kind of second chance book, and I think there's an element of Jane Austen's own personal hopes for second chances. Yeah, absolutely. Books. Um, yeah, and I mean, if you compare it to something like Northanger Abbey that hasn't aged well at all, it's kind of like... <laughs> That's so true. Yeah, it hasn't really, has it? As a kind no. of gothic style, yeah, with the gothic elements in that as well. Yeah. yeah, 
I mean, I think so many of her books have stood up well, and so or so many elements of her books have stood yeah. up well. But, but I think, um, but so many of the relationships, I think, as well, are, I suppose, if you took them out of their time, I don't know how much would substance would be left. But there is so yeah. much more substance to the love story in Persuasion yeah. that I think that yeah, it it sets it a step apart. Anyway, we can't keep talking about persuasion all night. So <laughs> let's go on to the next one. Uh, which is The Best a Man Can Get by John, John O'Farrell. Yeah. So this book is on the list as well because this is also a book that I remember because um, I read it a few years back, but it made me laugh out loud. And it has yeah. some fantastic lines in it, including, which I'll explain in a minute, one of the best descriptions of making tea that I've ever read <laughs> as a way to tell you all about a character. Um, but the premise of this book is that this character, Michael Adams, um, has, I think he writes um, uh, jingles for, you know, for, for adverts and things. Yeah. Um, and he's got a wife and two young kids. And he says to his wife that he's finding it very hard to concentrate at home. So he needs a different space to work in. So he just as I think um, a, a way to sort of have a bit of a um, makeshift studio. He rents a room in a house, you know, across town. He, stories in, set in London, he rents a room um, across town. And it starts out quite innocently, I think, in the sense that he really just, just mean it as a bolt hole that he can go to when he needs to work and he can crash the room <laughs> if he needs to, if he's on deadlines and things. Um, and then he, you know, can go back to the family home and to the kids. But it morphs into him. Um, it morphs into him effectively leading a double life, where he has this uh -huh. wife and kids, and then he's living in this house of you know this shared house where you know various other people yeah. live. I think most of them are students and things. Yeah. Um, there's a PhD student, a couple of other people, and they. I don't think they know. They don't know about his wife and kids, and his wife doesn't know anything about the house that he's living in. She just thinks he's renting this room and, and you know, isn't giving a lot of thought to what's going on there. She's yeah. trusting him to just be there working. And he's telling her, oh, I'm, at, you know, I'm absolutely slogging myself <laughs> out of work. I'm going to stay overnight for a couple of days. Um, and what's great about it is that, you, you know, it sounds so horrible and, and, and malicious, but actually there's something about the story you really sympathize with Michael you can kind of see how what started out as something very genuine and innocent yeah. does sort of slowly slide into someone who is a dad and has this you know demanding home life as all parents do where the, you know the kids need so much from you and yet he has this tantalizing opportunity to keep one foot in a more youthful single life really yeah. um and what's great about the book is <laughs> both parts of that, you know, both points of view. Um, it really is very funny um, and um, some real laugh out loud moments. Um, and the tea thing that I was talking about, this is, I've always remembered this, you know, again, in terms of lines or, or, or parts of books that stick with you, this has always stuck with me because there's a, a part of the book where um, Michael is with one of the other characters in the house who is a PhD student and um, the PhD student says, you know, he'll make everybody a cup of tea. And so what happens is the PhD student gets out the mugs and lines them up and he gets out the tea bags and he puts the tea bag in each cup and he gets the sugar off the shelf and he gets the milk out of the fridge. And when he's satisfied that it's all lined up, he gets the kettle and fills it up and puts it on to boil. Everybody knows that's not how you make tea. <laughs> you put the kettle on first. <laughs> yeah. So for me, there's, and it's written so much better than that, but as yeah. a way to tell you about somebody's personality and how someone who is doubtlessly very clever academically, but maybe functions with day-to-day -day tasks quite differently, that description I thought was just superb. So it's, it's smart, funny writing, um, and I think speaks to that part that, lot that well that question lots of people probably ask themselves about well what if I didn't still have what if I didn't have family and kids what you know 
or what if I could have it all? What if I could have both worlds? Because for a while, that's what Michael has. And that's why I think he's called the best a man can get. He has a bit of both for a while there. And then it falls to pieces for them. Yeah. And then it falls to pieces. Yeah. And then that's the later part of the book. And yeah. yeah. And, then and, and, then it, and then great, you know, the book then has those more poignant moments at the end. But, you know, it, but that sort of the complexity of that as he then navigates his way yeah. out of that is is really interesting. Yeah, it's a really good book. Okay, let's get on to the next one. The Salt Path by Raina Wynn. Yeah, so this, uh, people might be quite familiar with this. It was a big hit, um, I think two or three years ago now, this the first mm. one came out. Um, and it's actually, I didn't realise, it's the first, the two non-fiction books that I've got on my list are together here at the end. And when I was thinking about um, why I have picked this, um, or picked these two books. I think there's definitely something in there around um, connection to place and to countryside yeah. and something around that. But the, the amazing story of The Salt Path is that it's it's actually a true story of um, Raina Wynn and her husband, Moth. Um, and it's a very, it starts as a very traumatic story. Um, they... And again, this is in the premise. I'm not giving anything away here, but they um, lose their home, um, their home of, of many years, um, a beautiful home that they sort of built up partly themselves. They restored and renovated and, and their children grew up there. And at the same time as they lose their home, they find out that Moth, um, Raina's husband, is terminally ill. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this incredibly traumatic opening of the book where all that is happening. Um, and and then there's this description where they are reduced to some from this gorgeous home they are reduced very quickly to a few items in storage um and there's this and, and then basically i'm saying basically as if it's an easy thing but the way what Raina describes it in the book is she talks about how um, as they were going through their belongings and clearing up, and she found this this book of walking the southwest coast path. So, for anyone um, who who doesn't know where the southwest coast path is yeah. in England, it's basically if you're looking at a map of England, it's the sticky out foot bit on the <laughs> left hand yeah. side, and the southwest coast path basically takes in all of that kind of big heel of the country. Yeah. And it's 630 miles, it says in my notes here. Mm. Um, and and it takes in about four or five counties, I think, as well as it goes around. Um, and so she finds this book at this kind of incredibly painful moment in their life. And she feels compelled to walk. And I remember when I read this book, I loved it so much. And it's one of the books I have pressed on many people, you know, because you know when you love a book and you just want to tell yeah. everyone. And I, you know, I was so insistent I bought a copy on Amazon for um for you know various people in my life and said, you must read this book, you must read this book. Um and so I went back to read the reviews because I assumed it must have five out of five from everybody. And some of the reviews were, you know, I mean it has got an amazing you know review rating but then you know I then at curiosity looked at the less favorable ones and people sort of said things like well it's just to it's totally not you know incredible that somebody would choose to walk I mean that's ridiculous you know so many other things they could have done but there's something and logically if you look at it like that maybe there were but I can understand how when faced with probably the most profound double trauma that yeah. they've ever had in their life that there was something primal about the need to walk as a way to feel that you were still moving forward and not collapsing yeah into into the trauma um and so they go off on this walk um this this crazy walk and, and moth's illness is i can't remember what it's called but it was um he was basically they were basically told well he shouldn't be walking you know he's mm. he doesn't have the strength or capacity to be doing that but he says he wants to and off they go and a friend drops them at the top of the starting point of the coast path and they only have what they can carry 
And because they had no money, it's not like they invested in lots of specialist <laughs> lightweight yeah. equipment and, you know, um, amazing um, walking gear or anything. They, they had some fairly bog standard stuff. Um, and so they set off to walk the coast path. And again, because they don't really have any money, um, they can't be staying in hotels or even comfortable campsites. They do wild camping, which is actually illegal in England. <laughs> But, you know, anyway, yeah. shame on that. But they do wild camping and, and they and they do what they have to to survive. And the book is just, I mean, the, the sort of description of the book talks about how um, it's, you know, it's it's a book about hope, etc. I think ultimately it's a book about love. It's mm. a book about a powerful love that they have for each other. And it's a book about endurance in every way, physical, mental, and emotional endurance. Um, and it's absolutely beautiful. And it's set against some of the most stunning scenery in England. And if you, you know, and this, I was saying a little bit of this, wasn't I, Tim, before we started about, it's sometimes a funny thing to be English, you know, yeah. if, if that's your identity, because it can feel uncomfortable at times. And other times it just feels, amorphous it's hard to say what it is you know I think so often with there's a degree of embarrassment almost about being English we don't have the same we don't all have the same sort of pride that you know or sense of clear identity that the Scots or the Welsh or the Irish do and and yet there's something I love about England not the politics not the state of it currently but the landscape, it is yeah. a stunningly beautiful country. There's a huge amount of beautiful countryside crammed into this tiny island. Um, and what's amazing about the Southwest Coast Path, and that you see this through, through Rainer's eyes as well, is how dramatically that landscape changes mm. in just a few miles or from yeah. North Cornwall to South Cornwall. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and yeah so i think that the book will it will fill you with hope and it will you know make you give you a sense of what is possible um and how remarkable we are and what a remarkable journey they went on and it will make you want to walk <laughs> almost certainly um so whether it's 630 miles on the southwest coast path or somewhere else it there's a there's something about it i think it makes you want to reconnect to wildness yeah. and, and 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 a sense of powerful freedom that i think we lose a lot of the time in you know in day-to-day -day life so yeah i'm sure this book has been recommended before i would second or third that recommendation um if you haven't yet read it and she said Raina win has written subsequent books all to do with walking all to do with you know her and her and moth who um and again it's not a spoiler to say that moth i think was given a fairly dire prognosis mm. um but you know he walked all that way with Raina, and they have completed walks since then so yeah. yeah the magic of walking and of the countryside yeah well i think part of the element of the old pilgrimages was the walking so it's like, yeah it's so cathartic and yeah um, you know gives space for so much insight and stuff as well doesn't it and self-discovery yeah yeah okay let's go on to the last book a fate worse than death by ian itch um which i i think is only available with second hand or pre -owned. yeah i'm sorry about that i, I thought yeah well, i did I, I looked up there's about five books with this title but yeah, I didn't yeah. I'm like this title definitely so. if, you, if people search for this they must search for the E&H version not yeah. any other version because yeah there are various sort of murder mysteries and things I think that yeah. are under the same title um so a fate worse than death I think the subtitle is something like a a, a ramble through a, an English summer or something yeah. like that and that's basically what happens so E&H goes on a bit of a, a tour around England one summer and uncovers um, all of the rather bonkers things that English people apparently get up to in the course of a standard summer. And the premise says, from historical reenactors to giant vegetable shows at village fates, Wiltshire crop circle fanatics to Cotswold shin kickers, Blackpool stag parties to Cornish pasty sailings, Ian H takes all these into his stride as he goes in search of the English at play in the sunshine. And 
this is one of the funniest books <laughs> I've ever read as well. And one of the really funny things about this is it's all true and it's all bonkers. I mean, I don't, I won't want to spoil, you know, too much of the of the um, of the narrative for people who read it. But I mean, I, you, I've got to say something about the shin kickers because that's a real thing, you know, shin kicking. I mean, lots of people will have heard of things like the Gloucestershire cheese rolling, where yeah. Every year, a giant cheese is rolled down a hill and people chase after it. I mean, that's quite mad. But shin, and people get injured all the time doing it. Um, but shin kicking, I, I kind of, I hope it's still going because it's something I'd like to see one day. Um, people put on very long knee high socks, stuff some straw down the front, and then somebody else kicks you in the shins until you say no and you win. I say win. <laughs> In very loose says you get kicked the most before you say stop and these are summer traditions um but i i just absolutely loved this book it's such a mm. romp around the english countryside and i should say as well that you know these aren't things that are happening in big cities these are happening in small towns little yeah. villages around the country um you know if you were to go looking for them, um, you know, in, in any major place, you won't find them, you know, you, you've got to sort of uncover them in those small hidden places. And I think that this book, when I was thinking about all of this, really connects to the salt path in some way as well, because it's also about place and the land, because all of these strange and weird traditions came up um, because, you know, through a sense of, of place and what the things that happened in that place, you know, there is cheese rolling in Gloucestershire because they make that cheese there. There is, you know, wassailing, which happens in winter, actually, where people shake the leaves of apple trees to get the evil spirits out so that they get a good cider mm. crop. You know, yeah. that happens in places where they grow cider, you know. So all of these things, even if the origins now are lost in the annals of time, there will be a reason <laughs> that is connected to place. Um, and, you know, there are lots of heroes in this book. You know, the heroes you know, who grow the giant onions or organize the cheese rolling. Um, and I think what this did for me as well is it awoke for me a real fondness for all those sorts of summer events and all of these sorts of things, summer fates and strange, you know, giant Cornish pasty making and sailing it down a river and things like that. These are not things which are organized by city councils. These are no. things that are organized by groups of people coming together you know, often if it's something like a fete or a, or a summer fair, often the profits go to charity. Um, people give up their time for nothing, um, just for the good of their community. Or if it's something like, you know, shin kicking or cheese rolling, it's about keeping a tradition alive for... Um, sorry, one sec. Milo, Milo, okay. Sorry, because of the storm, there are a lot of strange noises that he's not used to. Oh, I'm here. Just a little bit of drama at the end there. Um, Milo, Milo. Right, that's enough. Is he, um, he He wants to do some chai, uh, or she wants to do some cheese rolling. <laughs> he's got an opinion. Um, yeah. On this. So, um, yeah, so I think that there's, there's something beautiful in that as well, and I think yeah. that comes through in the book, and it really made me um, appreciate all those school fates and things that I've been to, and village fates and things like that, because, um, yeah, because they, they are the they are people doing things for their place. And just to give a couple of other examples, because as I, as I mentioned um, before we started, you know, this book is another book that I have talked about regularly over the years and, yeah. and it suggested that people might like to read. And in talking about it, um, people have shared other stories with me of other crazy things which go on around, you know, the English countryside, um, some of which I can share because they are, not in the book um, and one of those was actually I used to work in Bridport down in Dorset and Bridport has a Milo thank you just leave him out there That's a dog, um, yeah. <laughs> and um, Milo come here come here anyway um, so come here now thank you um, so Bridport has a carnival and at the end of the carnival yeah. every year they do they have a torchlight procession um, and that isn't you know electric torches that is about 1500 lit flaming torches and people gather in the town square which is quite small 
and yeah. line up along the road and then they process all the way down the road to the beach and a bonf bonfire is lit. And the only way to describe this is that it looks like the people are going to the castle to get the beast. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's mad. It's it cool. looks yeah. really dangerous. Um, but the best one, um, somebody told me about, it happens in Ostery St. Mary, which is also just one of, you know, England has some fantastically weird place names. Yeah. Ostery St. Mary's one of the good ones. Um, and they have a flaming tar barrel um, procession every year um, where they, um, barrels are covered in tar. They are lit and then strapped to people's backs and they run through the streets with them. Oh. Um, and that still goes on. And it, they think that they don't really know why, it, <laughs> what the origins of that are. <laughs> but they think maybe it was a pagan um, ritual designed to clear evil spirits out of the streets. <laughs> so it's good to know that there shouldn't be any evil spirits in the streets at Ostery St. Mary because that continues to the day, to this day, as far as I know. So A Fate Worse Than Death is just such a great exploration of those weird and wonderful things that we hang on to, even if yeah. we can't remember why. Okay, well, that does a, a sound like the uh, Eurovision. That concludes the voting <laughs> of the Laura Cockett jury. Um, let's talk a little bit. Well, I have two questions that I generally ask. I used to have three questions, but I gave up on one of them. So, <laughs> um, if you had to select one of these books to give somebody, to give somebody, um. Is there an obvious choice or more broadly, what would be your decision tree as to what book you would pick to give somebody from this list? Just one oh, book. Just one book. Oh, gosh. I mean, it would, it would probably be, I mean, I think it would probably be The Salt Path. Yeah. Because I think it's, I think it's a really accessible book. I mean, it wouldn't be something like Vanity Fair because great as that book is, it's not a light read. Um, yeah. I think, you know, and if I'm going to gift somebody a book, it, you know, and I've got the one book, it probably wouldn't be, you know, one of the rom-coms necessarily or, 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 you know, or even persuasion. I think that it probably would be the salt path because I think it has such powerful themes around, you know, around our capacity to endure yeah. um, and around healing um and yeah and around and around around healing in in so many ways physically and emotionally um and it's just such a oh it's just a love it's in many ways as you go through it you realize it's a love story and it's a um a beautiful um kind of hymn to the countryside as well yeah it would be it would be the salt path i think if i had to pick one yeah, well, you have said that you've given that to people before. So. <laughs> yeah. but, but it might be that option. Um, and the other question, because often I'm talking to authors, and you you are in the process of authorising yourself. Yes. Becoming an author. Not quite how authorised works, but... You know, like, I like it. Um, have you got any idea when that's going to be available? And what was the process of writing it like? I mean, oh, that's when did good. you finish and how long did it take? And um, what, what do you think it changed you writing the book? Uh, do, do, do you think it changed me, did you say? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose, the, so to sort of take that in a few parts, I mean, I can tell people, first of all, it's coming out on the 4th of April. Oh, okay. Um, so Thursday, the 4th of April, it will be available. It's called Lie For Me, um, romantic comedy, friends to lovers. Um, and, and yeah, in terms of writing it, it was really, it's, it has been really interesting because I suppose in some ways it was, you know, a sort of five year journey to then writing the book in a month um, mm. because there was an awful lot of, and I, I think I'd, I've always wanted to write, um, yeah. but because my, my, my day job um, is, it's in a, you know, it's in a creative area anyway. Um, and I, you know, before I did, before I worked in doing what I do now, um, I worked in theatre for many years. So I think I felt like I was around storytelling. There was enough of being connected to storytelling that I think I kind of didn't need to scratch the itch desperately. Um, but time went on and I really felt like I, I needed to be writing. Um, 
and so five or so years ago I started kind of taking that a bit more seriously joined a writers group and things but it was a real kind of push and pull tussle um and it, you know and if I'm honest as well you know lots of excuses about why I didn't have the time to write and things like that and then I think eventually I got out of my own way last spring when I finally realized I didn't need to be the next Margaret Atwood yeah <laughs> probably can't be but um but, you know, I realized I didn't need to write something wholly original that was going yeah. to stun everybody, stun the critics and be a commercial success and all of that. You know, I didn't didn't need to. I just needed to write a story um, and I just needed to enjoy doing it. And so um, the process of writing the book in the end was I I read a really great book called How to Write Your Novel in 30 Days which just stripped away a lot of the nonsense thinking I had, yeah. you know, a lot of that nonsense thinking about, well, it's, you know, it's got to, it's got to be, it's got to be anything more than entertaining and fun. Um, you should and, have put it on the list. <laughs> well, do you know what? It was one of the things that yeah. I thought of straight after I sent you the list. I was, I, well, I thought of five more books. I thought, oh, no, I should have put these on instead. Yeah. But, you know, the, I could have written this list 10 times over, but yeah, yeah I, I did think I should have put that on because it, it has, it did unlock something for me. And it was the right, yeah. it, sometimes you find that, don't you? When you're reading lots of different things, you sometimes you just have the right book at the right time. Yeah. If somebody had given me, and I asked for that book for Christmas, um, and if somebody had given that to me two years ago, it would probably have been too soon, but it was, yeah, it was the right book. So kind of last sort of March, April time, I was reading that and then working on other ideas, actually, not lie for mm. me um that wasn't part of what i was thinking i was going to write at all and then one day it was, it was was it john steinbeck said that something like ideas are like rabbits you start with one and suddenly you've got a dozen or something like that i think i may have butchered that but something like that yeah. um and that's what happened you know i had a handful of ideas i'd been sort of tinkering with for a while thought i was going to pick one of those and write them and in the process of playing around with those yeah. this other idea came to me yeah not, a, not you know it's not kind of a, a brand new original idea nobody's had um but it felt fun and you know dialogue started coming in so i just sort of started writing and then i you know started planning it out a bit more and i wrote the first draft in a month um and then so that was kind of last may june and then fleshed it out and, and got it to an editor sort of September time. Um, and then we've just kind of been going back and forth since then, you know, on various different versions of, of editing. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed writing the first draft. I enjoyed a lot of the editing process. I think it's, um, and I think you can really feel as a, as a writer as well, when you get into flow and when it's really working. And yeah. I read another great quote recently as well, which said something like, you know, no laughter in the mouth. I can't remember who said this. No laughter in the mouth of the writer. No laughter in the mouth of the reader. No tears in the eyes of the writer. No tears in the eyes of the reader. Mm -hmm. And so actually what's really good is sometimes if I write something and it does make me chuckle a bit, I think, oh, great. I mean, you know, hopefully yeah. that'll amuse somebody else. Um, so, yeah, so uh, I really, so I really enjoyed that process. And, and I learned a huge amount. Um, and then what was really interesting is I started to write book two recently. Um, it's not a series, they're, they're standalone books, but, you know, my second book started to work yeah. on that. Um, and I had learned so much from book one and I did a couple of courses and et cetera, et cetera. And I wanted to try and correct, in inverted commas, the things I thought I had got wrong with the process of yeah. book one by planning in much more detail. So I planned out this whole book took me about two weeks in great detail, sat down to write it, couldn't do a thing. Um, so actually, what will be book two, I've now moved away from a, an intensive planning <laughs> process. I just started writing and it's a completely different story. So it's really, so it's really interesting, you know, I think as a writer coming to, you know, I'm very much in the early stages, but trying to discover what your creative process is, because there's a very organised part of myself that would love to have a detailed plan. Um, but at the moment, that doesn't work for me. Yeah. So, yeah, that's where yeah. it's at at the moment. Well, I've, I've never been able to write a book without a plan, but I usually throw away the plan somewhere in the middle <laughs> of the book. Or well, I veer of, off it some, to some other tent. Yeah, I'm sort of planning as I go along. So I, I kind of had, I knew, 
with the book I'm now writing, I, I really could see what was happening at the beginning, yeah. the first few chapters. So I just dove into those and then I had to stop and then plan a little bit more. And now yeah. I'm going back into that. So I think it's going to be not absence, not absent a plan the whole way through, but um, the, I'm sort of planning, writing, planning, writing like that. Yeah. Anyway, so to re 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 recap, re I was going to say recapitulate, but I was. <laughs> um, it's going to be out April fourth. April fourth, live for me. Yes, and actually, it won't be under Laura Cockett. It will be under my pen name, Laura J Ives. But oh. as far as I know, unless anything changes between now and April, there isn't another book called Lie for Me. There are lots of books. Oh, okay lie to me or lie with me but there isn't a book called lie for me because oh. the, one of the characters the, the female protagonist is asking her friend to lie and you know be the fake boyfriend sort of thing so um she's asking him to lie for her so yeah at the moment yeah, laura, coming, the only laura, one. laura jives yeah, like... <laughs> i know I Laura J. Ives. Laura yeah. J. Ives, yeah, yeah. So look for Laura Ives or L. J. Ives and life for me. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being the guest this evening. Thank and you. I'm going to start clicking random end stream buttons and hope one of them ends the stream <laughs> okay. somewhere. 